for real now. I'm, I'm not awake at all today. So, uh, Von Krieg, I've talked about quite a few times. If you uh, are interested in military history, if you're interested in military strategy, a political strategy, uh, politics, economics, activism, really, if you're interested in meaningfully interacting with the societal structures around you, Von Krieg and similar political uh, treatises are a really good way to dig into it. Particularly Clausewitz, a very, very short history of who he was. Uh, he was a Prussian strategist, theorist, uh, writes a lot about the Napoleonic era. No, we can just, we can just do this. We can go ahead and pop open, check out his wiki wikipedia page. This is, oh, look at this charming charming figure uh yeah born in 1780 died in 1831 so the the kind of socio-political background that he's talking about is he's he's still prussian he's not german right uh the german state hadn't been founded yet and this is really 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 an impactful work on the wars of the late 19th century, the early 20th century, meaning the world wars, it's instrumental in forming military and political doctrine for the 19th, 20th, and 21st centuries. So that's that's why it's important. He's a fascinating, fascinating figure to read about on his own. Uh, honestly, this is a long book. Uh, uh, this one is uh, over 420 pages long. I don't know if I ever finished this as a young person. I don't think I did. I think I got about halfway. So we're only talking about the first chapter today. I might come back and read more chapters, but uh, I, I think I remember it correctly in the first chapter being what I want to talk about. So here's a table of contents. Seems kind of long, huh? Yeah, uh, it is. It is. Uh, but today... We're just taking taking a look at what is war, and this is on the Gutenberg Project, the uh, PDF that I have here. Not even a PDF, the text file. <laughs> this is in, and I have the physical book in front of me, published by uh, All Penguin Classics. <laughs> we propose to consider first the single elements of our subject, and then branch then each branch or part, and last of all, the whole, in its relations, therefore to advance from the simple to the complex. It's necessary for us to commence with a glance at the nature of the whole, because it's particularly necessary in that consideration of any of the parts in their relation to the whole should be constantly kept in view. Okay, so we're, we're a sentence into this, two sentences into this, and already, uh, if the tone isn't blatantly aware, this is not an easy read. Uh, Clausewitz writes like a man of his time. Uh, this is also a translation of a treatise written in another language, albeit a similar language, and uh, separated from us from about two centuries at this point. So, it's okay to struggle with this shit. Uh, just like reading Marx, just like reading, uh, I mean, even modern academic stuff, it's wordy and uh, kind of self-referential and kind of difficult to read. So it's okay, it's okay. This this isn't easy. If you uh, have to take your time with it or if you're listening to this going, what the fuck did Alex just say? You're not alone. <laughs> Definition. We shall not enter into any of the abstruse definitions of war used by publicists. We'll keep to the element of the thing itself, to a duel. War is nothing but a duel on an extensive scale. If we would conceive as a unit the countless numbers of duels which make up a war, we shall do so best by supposing ourselves two wrestlers. Each strives by physical force to compel the other to submit to their will. Each endeavors to throw their adversary and thus render them incapable of further resistance. War, therefore, is an act of violence intended to compel our opponent to fulfill our will. Violence arms itself with the inventions of art 
and science in order to contend against violence. Self-imposed restrictions, almost imperceptible and hardly worth mentioning, termed usages of international law, accompanying it without essentially impairing its power. Violence, that is to say physical force, for there is no moral force without the conception of states and law, is therefore the means. The compulsory submission of the enemy to our will is the ultimate object. In order to attain this object fully, the enemy must be disarmed, and disarmament becomes therefore the immediate object of hostilities in theory. It takes the place of the final object, and puts it aside as something we can eliminate from our calculations. So this is this is why I love Klauswitz so goddamn much. You can read chapters, whole chapters from other theorists, from other political figures, and not get as much out of it as Klauswitz delivers in two and a half paragraphs here. These are these are uh, incredibly weighty, and this isn't even to the point where he's talking about war as politics as a or war as a continuation of politics by other means. Let's let's run through this again. War is a duel. In his conceptualization, war is a struggle between two forces attempting to impe impel their will on someone else to make the other party incapable of resistance. The means by which you make them incapable of resistance is by disarming them. And so, therefore, warfare is about disarming the other person in order to impress your will upon them. Very straightforward. And I really love this this first sentence. Where we're not going to talk about it like publicists. We're not going to dramatize it. We're not going to talk about the human element of it or the ethics or the morality of it. We're just going to talk about what it is mechanically. Seriously, all of this fits onto the first... Oh, come on. Come on, auto focus. No, it's too well too well lit. There we go. Put some shadow on it. All of this is just on the first page of the first chapter. Utmost use of force. Now, philanthropists may easily imagine there's a skillful method of disarming and overcoming an enemy without causing great bloodshed, and that this is the proper tendency of the art of war. However plausible this may appear, still, it is an error which must be extirpated. For in such dangerous things as war, the errors which proceed from a spirit of benevolence are the worst as the use of physical power to the utmost extent by no means excludes cooperation of intelligence, it follows that they who use force unsparingly, without reference to bloodshed involved, must obtain a superiority if their adversary uses less vigor in its application. The former then dictates the law to the latter, and both proceed to extremities, to which the only limitations are those imposed by the amount of counteracting force on each side. Uh, you know, not a pretty thing to say, not a pretty thing to admit. Uh, essentially, he's making the argument that morality and withholding power have no place in war, because if you do that, you're just giving an advantage to the opposition. And if you hold back, there's no reason to believe that they would hold back. This is the way in which the matter must be viewed. It is to no purpose... It's even against one's own interest to turn away from the consideration of the real nature of the affair because the horror of its elements excites repugnance. Yeah, I even admitting it's repugnant to look at, but it is what it is. If the wars of civilized people are less cruel and destructive than those of savages, they aren't. The differences arise from the social conditions both of states and themselves and their relations to each other. Out of the social condition and its relations, war arises. It's by war, and by it, war is subjugated to conditions. It's controlled and modified. But these things do not belong to war itself. They are only given conditions. 
and to introduce into the philosophy of war itself a principle of modern moderation would be an absurdity. Two motives lead people to war. Instinctive hostility and hostile intention. In our definition of war, we've chosen it as a characteristic, the latter of these elements, because it's more general. It's impossible to conceive the passion of hatred of the wildest description bordering on mere instinct without combining it with the ideal of hostile intention. On the other hand, hostile intentions may often exist without being accompanied by any, or at all, events by any extreme, hostility of feeling. Among savages, views emanating from, the, from feelings, among civilized nations, those emanating from understanding, have the predominance. But this difference arises from attendant circumstances, existing institutions, etc., and therefore is not to be found necessarily in all cases, although it prevails in the majority. In short, even the most civilized nations may burn with passionate hatred of each other. We may see from this what a fallacy it would be to refer to the war of a civilized nation entirely to an intelligent act on the part of the government, and to imagine it as continually freeing itself more and more from all passion of feeling in such a way that, at last, the physical masses of combatants would no longer be required. In reality, their mere relations would suffice, a kind of algebraic action. Theory was beginning to drift in this direction until the facts of the last war taught it better. The last war being the Napoleonic War. Uh, the Wars of Liberation, 1813-1814. I love that there's a footnote in here to talk about, and we can take a quick look at this once we're uh, done with this paragraph. If war is an act of force, it belongs necessarily also to feelings. If it does not originate in the feelings, it reacts, more or less, upon them. And the extent of this reaction depends not on a degree of civilization, but the importance and duration of the interests involved. Therefore, if we do not find civilized nations, if we find civilizations that do not put their... God, I, I keep meshing words together. My brain isn't awake yet. If we find civilizations do not put their prisoners to death, do not devastate towns and countries, this is because their intelligence exercises greater influence on their mode of carrying on war and has taught them more effectual means of applying force than rude acts of instinct. The invention of gunpowder, the constant progress of improvements in the construction of firearms, are sufficient proof that the tendency to destroy the adversary which lies at the bottom of the conception of war is in no way changed or modified through progress of civilization. We therefore repeat our proposition. War is an act of violence pushed to its utmost bounds. As one side dictates the law to the other, there arises a, sh a sort of reciprocal action which logically must lead to an extreme. This is the first reciprocal action and the first extreme which we will meet. Now, if we're, if we're taking a minute to think about what Clausewitz is saying here, what Clausewitz is talking about, war being um, an act of violence where one side dictates law to another, War doesn't just happen on battlefields. War happens in cities, in towns. War is an action by which police dictate law to those subject to police violence, right? War is the way that people with voting rights dictate law to those without voting rights. War is not just something that happens in guns on foreign soil, it happens on our soil, by the pen and by the sword, every day. And he, he talks about it's no purpose to try to turn away from this, to try to say that the intellectual elements of warfare, the intellectual exercises of, oh, just because we don't put our prisoners to death, it doesn't mean you're not at war. Just because you found more ways to exercise influence 
on your enemy without direct violence does not mean that you are not participating in violence. And again, we're, we're two pages in. <laughs> we're two pages in. And Klaus is hitting with some uh, superficially, like, yeah, of course, kind of statements, but if you read into their implications, it's a bit fair. The aim is to disarm the enemy. We've already said that it's the aim of all action in war is to disarm the enemy. And we'll now show this. Theoretically, at least, it is indispensable. If our opponent is to be made to comply with our will, we must place them in a situation which is more oppressive to them than the sacrifice that we demand. It's, it's so fucking good. Uh, so, if someone is to comply with your will or law, you need to put them in a situation more oppressive to them than the law. You have to go beyond the law in order to enforce the law, essentially. You have to subject them to conditions worse than what you intend to subject them to in order to subject them to the violent or undesirable conditions. Because then when you roll it back, when you take a step back, it won't be met with resistance, it'll be met with relief. The disadvantages of this position must naturally not be of a transitory nature, at least in appearance. Otherwise, the enemy, instead of yielding, will hold out in the prospect of a change for the better. Every condition in this position, which is produced by continuation of the war, should therefore be a change for the worse. The worst condition in which a belligerent can be placed of that is that of being completely disarmed. If, therefore, the enemy is to be reduced to a submission by an act of war, they must either be positively disarmed or placed... I lost it. I lost it because I looked up. Uh, worst condition reduced it. Positively disarmed or placed in such a position that they are threatened with it. From this, it follows that disarming or overthrow of the enemy, whichever we call it, must always be the aim of warfare. Now, war is always the shock of two hostile bodies in collision, not the act of a living power upon an inanimate mass. Because an absolute state of endurance would not be making war. Therefore, what we've just said is the aim of action in wars applies to both parties. Here, then, is another case of reciprocal action. As long as the enemy is not defeated, they may defeat me. Then I will no longer be my own master. They will dictate the law to me, as I did to them. This is the second kind of reciprocal action, which leads to a second extreme. Again, again! So fucking good, and look how concise he makes it. He's not just talking about states imposing their will on one another. Now, the language is the shock of two hostile bodies in collision. These bodies can be social bodies, they can be political bodies, they can be military bodies, they can be state bodies, they can be physical bodies. These bodies can be defined by class, they can be defined by race, they can be defined by nationality, they can be defined by ideology. But so long as there are two hostile bodies in collision, attempting to impose their will on one another or resist the will being opposed on them that is war you know in english it's really easy to uh to shy away especially if you're american shy away from ideas of war we use so much colorful language to describe civil unrest or protests or writing or civil disputes Heated arguments, domestic terrorism, extra legal means. We, we use so much colorful language to talk about things that are warfare without calling it warfare. We try so hard in the United States particularly to have this illusion that we have not been in perpetual warfare since our advent. In declared wars, with the exception of about 
uh, what, like 20 years? Every, uh, total in our history that we haven't been at war? And those are just declared wars and undeclared wars. We've constantly been attempting to impose uh, classist, racist, sexist <laughs> values and laws on the unwilling. And we've done so through the utilization of force, both political, economic, and physical. The utmost exertion of powers. If we desire to defeat the enemy, we must proportion our efforts to their power of resistance. This is expressed by the product of two factors which cannot be separated, namely the sum of the available means and the strength of the will. The sum of available means may be estimated in a measure. It depends, although not entirely, upon numbers. But the strength of volition is more difficult to determine, and can only be estimated to a certain extent by strength of motives. Granted, we have attained this in a way an approximation to the strength of power to be contended with. We can then take a review of our own means, and either increase them as to obtain a preponderance, or, in the case we have not the resources to effect this, then do our best by increasing our means as far as possible. But the adversary does the same, therefore, there is a new mutual enhancement, which, in pure conception, must create a fresh effort towards an extreme. This is a third case of reciprocal action, and a third extreme which, which, with which we meet. Uh, this, this actually gets kind of Marxist in talking about these um, oh, modification in the reality. Yeah, we're not there yet. We, when he's talking about these strengths on numbers, uh, the, the means particularly, who is able to produce weapons of war, whether they be physical implements by which to harm another's body, by which to force another's body to submit, whether they be political, intellectual, social, artistic elements by which to impose your will on another's mind, another's spirit, in order to subdue, disarm, and force another's mind to submit these two are both important now when he's speaking about the will uh, that's that's something that has evolved to the point where we refer to it as morale morale was a term that came from around this time period from a french theorist and i can't remember the french theorist's name uh, at the time they were competing theorists uh Clausewitz argued uh a much more mechanical view of war, which is being quite obvious, a very uh, materialist perspective of war. The Elan uh, morale that was talked about at this time came from French theory, thinking that warfare was more often, and excellence in warfare was more often individual exceptional acts rather than these kind of material underlying conditions that Clausewitz speaks to. Now, in truth, they both contribute, but, uh, obviously, I'm a materialist, so Klaus is, Clausewitz is much more in my wheelhouse. Modification in the reality. Thus, reasoning in the abstract, the mind cannot sh stop short of an extreme. Because it has to deal with an extreme, with the conflict of forces left to themselves and obeying none other but their own inner laws. If we should seek to deduce from pure conception of war an absolute point for the aim which we shall propose, and for the means which we shall apply, this constant reciprocal action would involve us in extremes, which would be nothing but a play of ideas produced by an almost invisible train of logical subtleties. If adhering closely to the absolute, we try to avoid all difficulties by a stroke of the pen, and insist with logical strictness that in every case the extreme must be the object, and the utmost effort must be exerted in that direction. Such a stroke of the pen would be a mere paper law, not by any means adapted to the real world. Even supposing this extreme tension of forces was an absolute which could be easily ascertained, 
We still must admit that the human mind would hardly submit itself to this kind of logical chimera. There would be, in many cases, an uncertain, unnecessary waste of power, which would be in opposition to other principles of statecraft. An effort of will would be required disproportion to the proposed object, which, therefore, it would be impossible to realize, for the human will does not derive its impulse from logical subtleties. But everything takes a different shape when we pass from abstractions to reality. In the former, everything must be subject to optimism, and we imagine the one side as well as the other striving after perfection, and even attaining it. Will this ever take place in reality? It will if, one, war becomes a completely isolated act, which arises suddenly and is in no way connected with previous history of the combatant states. Obviously, that's impossible, has never happened, will never happen. Number two, it's limited to a single solution or to several simultaneous solutions. Again, impossible. Number three, if it contains within itself the solution perfect and complete, free from any reaction upon it, through calculation beforehand of the political situation which will follow from it. He's presenting an impossible reality here. And I, you know, this is reflected in, in abstractions, everything is subjected to optimism. We imagine everything striving after perfection and even attaining it. Now, this, this sort of critique that he raises is a fair critique to talk about really anything in theory when we talk about political theory, social theory, economic theory. Uh, it's, a, it's a common cry of people who do well enough under capitalism, don't suffer too much, to go, well, socialism, you know, there's some problems with that. Communism, there's some problems with that. Libertarianism, there, there's some problems with that. Hold on, hold on. It's not perfect. You know, here are some flaws, while ignoring the flaws in their own system. And when thinking about reform, go, yeah, what we have now isn't perfect. So if you can give me something perfect... I'll take it, but there's this aversion to taking risk, aversion to experiencing other forms of imperfection. Uh, it's it's a common, common knee-jerk reaction in American circles to go, well, ah, that solution isn't perfect. Come back to me with a, a perfect solution, a perfect idea, and they don't exist. Perfect wars don't exist, perfect conflicts don't exist, because they can't be removed from reality they can never be completely isolated acts they can never just arise suddenly for no reason they can never be completely unconnected with the history of the combatant states now the wars and conflicts never have a single solution or a simultaneous solution they never have a perfect or complete solution these Things do not exist, so we have to modify these theories, these perfect optimistic theories and abstractions to reality. We have to make concessions to reality. War is never an isolated act, so now he's going one after the other, walking through these points, doing what I just did and saying, this is impossible, this is impossible, this is impossible. Therefore, war is never an absolute. But we'll go through it. And I forgot that he did this, so I'm feeling <laughs> a little, a little like a jump the gun uh, explaining what he's going on to explain. War is never an isolated act. With regard to the first point, neither of the two opponents is an abstract person to the other. Not even as regards that factor in the sum of resistance, which does not depend on the objective things vis-a-vis -vis of will. The will is not an entirely unknown quantity. It indicates what it will be tomorrow by what it is today. War does not spring up quite suddenly, it does not spread to the full in a moment. Each of the two opponents can therefore form an opinion of the other, in a great measure from what they do, what they 
uh, from what they are and what they do, instead of judging them according to what they, stri strictly speaking, should do or should be. But now, man with his incomplete organization is always below the line of absolute perfection. And thus, these deficiencies, having an influence on both sides, become a modifying principle. So essentially, because war is never an isolated act, we have to take that into consideration. The second point gives rise to the following considerations. If war ended in a single solution, or a number of simultaneous ones, then naturally, all the preparations for the same would have a tendency to the extreme, for an omission could not in any way be repaired. The utmost, then, that the word of reality could not be furnished as a guide for us would be the preparations of the enemy, as far as they are known to us. All the rest would fall into the domain of the abstract. But if the result is made up from several successive acts, naturally that which precedes all with its phases may be taken as a measure for that which will follow. And in this manner, the world of reality again takes the place of the abstract, and thus modifies the effort towards an extreme i.e. things change and you can't plan for it. Yet every war would necessarily resolve itself into a single solution or sum of simultaneous results if all the means required for the struggle were raised at once, or could be at once raised. For as one adversary results necessarily diminishes the means, then if all the means have been applied in the first, a second cannot be properly be supposed. All hostile acts which might follow would be essentially to the first and form in reality only its duration. Essentially things change and you can't just do it instantly because that moment passes and the thing you prepared for, the thing you reacted against, the thing you took means to, the uh, ends that you were trying to meet, they change. He does it in a God, he, he talks about it in such a fucking 18th century way that it <laughs> kind of hurts to, to walk through. This is, uh, this is a, a charming, and I say that with a, a bit of sarcasm, charming thing of this period. Oh god, he wasn't done yet. Uh, I really hate how people in the 1700s wrote. I, I do. <laughs> As a historian, don't love it. It's so fucking circular and... They refer to their references, to their sub-references, and then snake their way back to what they were talking about in the first place. It's very similar to the way I write, but it makes me want to throttle them and just be like, do bullet points, just get to the fucking point. That this part of the means of resistance, which cannot at once be brought into activity in many cases, is a much greater part of the whole than it might be first supposed. It often restores the balance of power, seriously affected by the great force of the first decision will be more, show, bleh, more fully shown hereafter. Here it's sufficient to show a complete concentration of all the available means in a moment of time is contradictory to the nature of war. Now this in itself furnishes no ground for relaxing our efforts to accumulate strength in order to gain the first result, but because an unfavorable issue is always a disadvantage to which no one would purposefully expose himself, and also because the first decision, although not the only one, still will have the more influence on subsequent events, the greater it is in itself. Now, the possibility of gaining a later result causes men to take refuge in that exception, in that expectation, owing to the repugnance in the human mind to making excessive efforts, and therefore forces are not concentrated, measures are not taken for the first decision that with that energy which would otherwise be used. Whatever one belligerent omits from weakness becomes the other a real objective ground for limiting their own efforts. And thus, again, through reciprocal action, extreme tendencies are brought down to efforts on a limited scale. I.e., you, you can solve a problem by going to the most extreme methods possible. But because of what he refers to as 
the repugnance in a human mind to making excessive efforts. Uh, it's, a, it's a wonderful phrase, wonderful way to describe compassion <laughs> or, or morality or ethics or mercy. Uh, he, he describes is the repugnance of the human mind to making excessive efforts. <laughs> it's, it's not colorful. We'll put it that way. It's, it's very cold. Uh, you could preempt, um, a decades long conflict in another country by nuking the country. Thousands of your people don't have to die. The war would end in a day. That'd be the end of it. Yeah, there are other complications. But, you know, he, he wrote this in a time period long before the conception of, you know, aircraft, let alone military aircraft. Anyway, let alone the conceptualization of weapons with the capability to wipe out entire cities. Right? Uh, this, this point... Uh, war does not consist of a single instantaneous blow. It still holds up, but it doesn't hold up as well as it did when he wrote it. Some wars, the last war, could consist of a si single simultaneous blow. And this instantaneous blow could end both parties involved. Now, this the whole idea behind mutually assured respect destruction is we built up our means of warfare that he talks about. Did I skip this? I may have. Doesn't matter. <laughs> Doesn't matter. Uh, I don't recall reading about fortresses, mountains, river, people, etc. Hmm. Yeah, this translated differently. Interesting. Okay, interesting. Uh, that's actually quite cool. Mine's translated differently than this. Uh, this this is the one point I ran into that I'm like, hmm, Clausewitz is outdated. Uh, a lot of this holds up, but a instantaneous war is possible. Uh, now, now, to his point, you don't just materialize that out of thin air. It took the military industrial complex decades to build up to a point where it could even conceive of such a weapon and then to produce a weapon took the better part of a decade then to mass produce that weapon took the better part of a decade and then to turn that mass produced weapon into a nearly instantaneous launch system took the better part of a decade and in the 60s in the 70s we had ICBMs that could nearly instantaneously start and end war. And the ideological opposition had the same weapons that could instantly start or end a war. And so the only solution is to not fight that war. That'd be great. I got it. I wish, I wish, uh, be like, oh, okay, Clausewitz, but what if both powers could do that and have mutually assured destruction? I don't think that was an idea in their vocabulary back then. So we can kind of put that one aside and maybe not touch on that too much, but essentially he's making the point that uh, you cannot plan a war on paper and then just it's over, it's perfect, it's immediate, no plan survives first contact with the enemy, that kind of thing is his point here. The result in war is never absolute. Lastly, even the final decision of a whole war is not always to be regarded as absolute. The conquered state sees it only as a passing evil, which may be repaired in after times by means of political combinations. How much of this must modify the degree of tension, the vigor of efforts made, is evident of itself. I mean, really quick. Um, yeah, war is never absolute in this time. Wars end. Cities rebuild. Countries move on. 
but they are sometimes and again in his european central european context this was a bit out of his purview right he wasn't thinking about wars of genocide that would take place in the next century he wasn't thinking about wars of total annihilation that would take place in the next two centuries he he was not conceiving of the industrial and technological means by which civilization would eventually mechanize and machinize to make it so that for some war is the end war is not a passing evil even for the victor and there are places on this planet so poisoned by radiation that they are uninhabitable to human beings and our ability to make more of those is disturbing so these last two points essentially war may be able to be fought instantaneously and absolutely but it's not a war anyone would walk away from in the 17 or uh 1700s 1800s this was not a capability that we had it is the capability we have now and there are modern treatises on uh, nuclear war theory but that's beyond us so assuming that we're not killing each other with nuclear weapons these hold true <laughs> right um even even when a war is over they're never absolute even when war does break out it's never a single instantaneous act wars take time and even when wars end they rarely result in the laid out goals that the war was started for compromise is a thing the probabilities of real life take the place of the conceptions of the extreme and the absolute in this manner, the whole act of war is removed from a rigorous law of forces exerted to the utmost. If the extreme is no longer to be apprehended, and no longer to be sought for, it's left to judgment to determine the limits for the efforts to be made in place of it. And this can only be done with the data furnished by facts of the real world by laws of probability. Once the belligerents are no longer mere conceptions, but individual states and governments, once war is no longer an ideal, but a definite substantial procedure, then the reality will furnish the data to compute the unknown quantities which are required to be found. From the character, the measures, the situation of the adversary and relations with which they're surrounded, each side will draw conclusions by the law of probability as to the designs of the other and act accordingly. The political object now appears. Here is the question, which we've laid aside forces, the question which we have laid aside forces itself again into consideration, vis-a-vis -vis the political object of war. The law of the extreme. The view to disarm the adversary, to overthrow them, has hitherto a certain extent usurped the place of this end or object. Just as this law loses its force, the political object must again come forward. If the whole consideration is a calculation of probability based on definite persons and relations, then the political object, being the original motive, must be an essential factor in the product. The smaller the sacrifice we demand from our opponent, the smaller, it may be expected, will be the means of resistance which they will employ. The smaller his preparation, the smaller will ours require to be. Further, the smaller our political object, the less value shall we set upon it, the more easily shall it be induced to give it up altogether. So if we put small demands on them, they'll concede more easily. But so too will we concede more easily because it's not important to us. This is why, this is why movements for, oh, I don't know, protesters saying defund the police by 50% are asking for 50% because it's real, it's substantial. If they were like, yeah, we want a 2% reduction, nobody's marching for a 2% reduction. Nobody's marching for a 5% reduction, right? Protests don't spring up over, we want 
Aunt Jemima gone. That that was never the call, right? <laughs> what what pushes people to action? What will drive the will to engage in these sorts of actions tends to be a greater degree and a greater extent of this political object. Thus, therefore, the political object, as the original motive of the war, will be the standard for determining both the aim of the military force and the amount of effort to be made. He's golden when he writes these fucking sentences. This. The political object of the war is therefore the standard by determining the aim of force and the amount of effort to be made. This is really good. The Cassus Belli, the, the reason for going to war, defines the war and defines the extent that people are willing to go for the war. Brianna Taylor being killed in her sleep in a no-knock warrant raid by police officers for a crime she and no one in her household committed. Yeah. Yeah, fear of police doing that, not even losing their jobs. Fear of that happening to us. Fear of that happening for the better part of a century. George Floyd being killed because he may have given fake bills and because he might have struggled a little bit. These are things that have a high political object. A great political object that inspire a strong will and a strong reaction from people. These are human lives. These are not human lives overseas. These are human lives in our towns, in our cities, in our homes. And people lacking melanin, like me, were exempted, and oftentimes, from this violence, but seeing it repeated time and time again, seeing it viscerally, so often as we do, remind us of this political object and remind us and reinforce the importance of this polit political object, this, this abolition, this revocation of the monopolization of violence by the state and its apparatus in the police. This is the sort of thing that has pushed people to protest for 35 36 days straight now. It does not... People do not do a big thing over a small thing. Uh, and I'm done with that paragraph. Right? No, that was just the first sentence. And of course, this itself... This is... the This, it cannot be in it itself. Why? Wow, it's... God. This, it cannot be in itself, but it is so in relation to both the belligerent states. It in is, it, just too many it, 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 it sounds. Because we're concerned with realities, not with mere abstractions. One and the same political object may produce totally different effects upon different people. Or even upon the same people at different times. Now that's an important thing. We can therefore only admit the political object is a measure by considering in its effects upon the masses which it is to move, and consequently the nature of those masses also comes into consideration. It's easy to see that the result may be very different according to these masses or animated with the spirit which will infuse vigor into action or otherwise. It's quite possible for such a state of feeling to exist between two states that a very trifling political motive for war, like the assassination of uh, an archduke, may produce an effect that's quite disproportionate. In fact, a perfect explosion. There's a lot in here. There's a lot in here that uh, he goes over very quickly, but... Uh, da, 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 da. 
The same political object may produce totally different effects upon different people. Some people see George Floyd dying and go like, oh, that's, that's bad. I can't believe it. I'll sign a petition and then a week later go back to posting memes. Some people see that, aren't surprised, are continually in depressed and enraged because this thing has been happening for a century and the economic situation in the United States is at such a moment where it enables people or people are left with no other economic uh, distraction, i.e. a job, to keep them from rioting and protesting that they are driven to it or there are other mitigating factors that have so upset the unrest in this country that that's a breaking point. Uh, you know, it's not one thing it's not simple different parts of societies will be affected different cultures will be affected by different things uh like if i don't know if an american today killed justin trudeau i guess it'd be the other way around if a canadian killed trump the united states would not go well guess we have to invade uh canada However, if a Serbian kills an Austrian Archduke, the Austrians, who were already looking for an excuse to invade, might invade. I guess they were Austrian-Hungarians at that point, but, I mean, they were Austrians. Okay. This applies to the efforts with which the political object will carry forth in the two states and the aim which the military action so prescribe itself. At times, it may be itself that aim, as, for example, the conquest of a province. At other times, the political object is not suitable for the aim of military action. Then such a one must be chosen as the will, as will be an equivalent for it, and stand in its place as regards to the conclusion of peace. But also, in this, Due attention to the particular character of states always is, uh, is always supposed. There are circumstances in which the equivalent must be much greater than the political object in order to secure the latter. The political object will be much more than the standard of aim and effort and have more influence in itself than more the masses are indifferent. The less that any mutual feeling of hostility prevails in two states from another causes, and therefore, their cases where the political object is almost alone will be decisive. Uh, essentially, if you want something, you have to take that thing. If you cannot take that thing, you have to take something more valuable than that thing in order to get that thing. This is, again, very 17th century, or uh, very 18th century writing of him, and it makes my eyes glaze over. So if it makes yours glaze over, you're not alone. It's ugly wording. Uh, essentially, if you want the police to reduce, have their budget reduced by 50%, you need to capture or endanger assets of that value in order to use that as leverage to get what you want. So when uh, Seattle, Mary, <laughs> Seattle Mayor Jenny Durkin is offering a 5% budget cut for the Seattle Police Department, that may be because she's calculated that about 5% is about what the protest and movement you have is worth to her and worth to the status quo. That you are not meaningfully endangering or uh, exerting power over assets equaling in value to the value that you are demanding from them. I either not taking you seriously because you're not uh stepping up pressure but then you protest outside of Jenny Durgan's house a couple of times and she'll flip the fuck out and start lashing back at you uh you know her uh, conditions for what she's willing to concede haven't changed but there you're hitting home there you're affecting her will there you're affecting you know it, it's it's very interesting talking about will and he does later on uh, getting people to a point where they will concede something. Yeah, yeah, there's there's a lot of arithmetic, I think he describes it as, in trying to figure out this sort of thing. If the aim of military action is an equivalent for the political object, that action will in general diminish. 
as the political object diminishes. And in a greater degree, the more the political object diminishes, dominates. Thus ex is explained how, without any contradiction in itself, there may be wars of all degrees of importance and energy, from a war of extermination down to mere use of an army of observation. This, however, leads to a question of another kind, which we hereafter have to develop and answer. And the uh, idea that an action will diminish, the political action object of an action will diminish over time, right? Or as conditions change. That's part, that's part of why protests that we're seeing right now are so self-sustaining is these protests are being met with police brutality, with police violence, with state violence. The state violence is being recorded and streamed and restreamed and clipped and put up on TikTok and Twitter and YouTube and Twitch and Facebook and every vestige of the internet. And these posts, these videos, are reinforcing this political object, reinforcing this Cass's belly. It's serving to justify, legitimize, and embolden the cause of protesters. That the violence exhibited by the state, by the police state, by the United States, is justifying these actors and these protesters. It's, it's a fascinating feedback loop. It's a fascinating, as he describes it, reciprocal action. A suspense in the action of war unexplained by anything said as yet. However insignificant the political claims mutually advance, however weak the means put forth, however small the aims to which military action is directed, can this action be suspended even for a moment? This is a question which penetrates deeply into the nature of the subject. Every transaction requires for its accomplishment a certain time, which we call its duration. This may be longer or shorter, according to the person acting throws more or less dispatch into their movements. About this more or less, we should not trouble ourselves here. Each person acts in their own fashion, but the slow person does not protract the thing because they wish to spend more time about it, but because, by their nature, they require more time. If they made more haste, they would not do things so well. This time, therefore, depends on subjective causes, and belongs to the length, so-called, of the action. If we allow now to every action in the war this, its length, then we must assume, at first sight at least, that any expenditure of time beyond this length, that is, every suspension of hostile action, appears in absurdity. With respect to, it must not be forgotten that we now speak not of progress of one or other of the two opponents, but of the general progress of the whole action of the war. So, just because a victory takes a long time to happen, doesn't mean it's not a victory. Just because a victory happened quickly does not mean it's a total victory. A suspension in the action of the war, a, a ceasefire, a Christmas truce, a calm day, is not an end of the war, it's just a part of the war. I feel like this section must be in response to some sort of critique or idea at the time, it seems a little out of the blue for me, honestly. But, you know, just because class struggle is a slow grueling process doesn't mean that it's over, doesn't mean that you've lost, though it does kind of mean that you've lost. Every day is a loss <laughs> if you're not winning. There's only one cause which can suspend action. And this seems to be only possible on one side in any case. If two parties have armed themselves for strife, then a feeling of animosity must have moved them to do it. As long now they continue armed, that is, do not come to terms of peace, this feeling must exist. And it can only be brought to a standstill by either side by one single motive alone, which is that they wait for a more favorable moment for action. 
Now at first sight, it appears this motive can never exist except on one side. Because of it, ipso ito, io ipso, bleh, ipso ito, it's not what that says at all. I don't know where I got the... Oh, that's, that's some dyslexia kicking in, I guess. Must be prejudicial to the other. If one has an interest in action, then the other must have an interest in waiting. That's, that's so good. That's so fucking good. Uh, if one side has an interest in action, has an interest in reform, has an interest in change, then the other side must have an interest in waiting. Reformists, progressives, we call them in this country, progressives and centrists are enemies. All right, I, I want you to have that very clear in your mind. Centrists are not neutral. They are your enemy because they have an interest in waiting. In waiting and continuing a status quo that is harmful to you. If it is in your interest to act, your interest to affect change immediately, if it would save lives of you and those like you, and you are being met by those who have an interest in waiting, an interest in saying it's not the right moment yet, we need to wait, it's, it's not, not the time, or, you know, we'll put together an investigative committee. They're trying to wait you out, they're trying to deplete your resolve, deplete your will, deplete your power through attrition. They are your enemy. And that needs to be blatantly clear. You're pushing one way or the other. And if you don't think that you're pushing, you need to look harder at what you're doing because you are pushing. It's it's inertia and gravity. You can't be neutral. Every transaction requires for its accomplishment a certain time. Ah, uh, ha, 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 hold on. Which we call its duration. I already read that, didn't I? Yeah, I'm on 13. I'm on 13, thank you. I'm like, wait, a complete equilibrium of forces. Yeah, that's where I'm at. Can never produce the suspension of action. For during suspension, they who have the positive object, that is, the assailant, must continue progressing. For if we imagine an equilibrium in that way, then they who have the positive object, therefore the strongest motive, can at the same time only command the lesser means, so that the equation is made up by a product of motive and power. Then we must say, if no altercation of the condition of an equi equilibrium is to be expected, the two parties must make peace. But if an alteration is to be expected, then it can only be favorable to one side, therefore the other has a manifest interest to act without delay. We see that the conception of an equilibrium cannot explain a suspension of arms, but that it ends in the question of the expectation of a more favorable moment. Let us suppose that one of two states has a positive object, for instance, the conquest of one of the enemy's provinces, which is to be utilized in the settlement of a peace. After this conquest, their political object is accomplished, the necessity for action ceases, and for them a pause ensues. If the adversary is also contented with this solution, they will make peace. If not, they must act. Now we suppose that in four weeks they will be in a better condition to act, then they have, insu they have sufficient grounds for putting off the time of action. But from that moment the logical course for the enemy appears to be to act so that they may not give the conquered party the desired Time. Of course, in this mode of reasoning, a complete insight into the state of circumstances on both sides is supposed. So even if you get a piece, even if you get a concession, if your opposition is just trying to buy time through this committee, through this reform, through this temporary order, to make things go back to normal, to slowly roll back or maintain the status quo, then you need to keep pushing. Even if you get what you ask for, if your gains are put at risk by a slow buildup in this interim period, 
Unless you can hold on to what you've won, you haven't won it at all. If this unbroken continuity of hostile operations really existed, the effect would be that everything would again be driven towards an extreme. For irrespective of the efforts of such an incessant activity in inflaming feelings, and infusing into the whole a greater degree of passion, a greater elementary force, there would also follow in this continuation of action a stricter continuity, a closer connection. Hold on, does this have the same uh, typo that I have? Okay. My book has a connection. It's spelled with an X instead of T-I-O-N. Uh, it's X-I-O-N. Uh, I love that. Connection. Let's see. Uh, I, this won't show up on camera. Well, it, this is this is too dark. Um, it's underlined. No, sorry. That's the section on attacking and dethroning God. Yep. Oh, come on. Go into folk. Connection. There we go. Beautiful. Penguin. Penguin Classics. I'm amazed. Their editorial team is actually really, really good. I found a typo in a Penguin book. My god. Uh, between cause and effect, and thus every single action would become of more importance, and consequently more replete with danger. But we know that the course of action in war has seldom or never been unbroken continuity. That there have been many wars in which action occupied by far the smallest portion of time employed and the whole of the rest being consumed in inaction. It's impossible that this should always be an anomaly. Suspension of action in war must therefore be possible. That's no contradiction in itself. We now proceed to show how this is. Okay, so just because there's a truce or ceasefire or you stop because of the weather or a holding action to rebuild your forces to recover to whatever else, even if there's a lull in the action, it's not the end of the war. Here, therefore, the principle of polarity is brought into requisition. As we've supposed the interests of one commander to always be antagonistic to those of the other, we've assumed a true polarity. We reserve a fuller explanation of this for another chapter merely making the following observation on it at present. The principle of polarity is only valid when it can be conceived in one and the same thing, where the positive and its opposite, the negative, completely destroy each other. In a battle, both, strides, both sides strive to conquer. That is true polarity, for the victory of one side destroys that of the other. But when we speak of two different things, which have a common relation external to themselves, then it is not the things, but their relations, which have the polarity. Yeah. Yeah. So the... the oh, God. Pop all my joints. Yeah. It's not things, but their relationship to one another, which has the polarity. It's, I, I don't assume why um, we assume a true polarity I don't get why that's important I, I I get in a sense it's important because he's trying to draw a distinction between the reality and the abstract and in the abstract we've been talking about things being in a polarity uh, right uh, this this binary of force a force B no compromise uh, but that their relationships which have the polarity not inherently the things themselves which is an important distinction but i don't really get the importance of the distinction in this context attack and defense are things differing in kind and of unequal force polarity therefore not applicable to them there is only one form of war to wit the attack of the enemy, therefore no defense. Or, in other words, if the attack was distinguished from defense merely by a positive motive, which one has and the other has not, but methods of each were precisely one and the same, then in this sort of fight every advantage gained on one side would be a corresponding disadvantage on the other, and true polarity would exist. But action in war is divided into two forms. Attack 
and defense, which we shall hereafter explain things more particularly, are very different and of an equal strength. Polarity, therefore, lies in that to which both bear relation, in the decision, not in the attack or defense itself. If one commander wishes the solution put off, the other must wish to hasten it, but only in the same form of action. If it's in A's interest not to attack his enemy at present, but four weeks hence, then it's in B's interest to be attacked. Not four weeks hence, but at the present moment. This is the direct antagonism of interests, but it by no means follows that it would be for B's interest to attack A at once. That's plainly something altogether different. The effect of polarity is often destroyed by superiority of defense over the attack, and thus the suspension of action in war is explained. If the form of defense is stronger than that of offense, as we shall hereafter show, the question arises, is the advantage of a deferred decision as great on one side as the advantage of the defensive form on the other? If it's not, then it cannot be its counterweight overbalance the latter, and thus influence the progress of the action of the war. We see, therefore, that the impulsive force existing in the polarity of interest may be lost in the difference between strength of the offensive and the defensive, and thereby become ineffectual. If, therefore, that side for which the present is favorable is too weak to be able to disperse with the advantage of the defensive, they must put up with the unfavorable prospects with which the future holds out. For it may still be better to fight a defensive battle in the unpromising future than to assume the offensive or make peace at present. Now, being convinced that the superiority of the defensive, rightly understood, is very great, and much greater than may appear at first sight, we conceive that the greater number of periods of inaction which occur in war are thus explained without involving any contradiction. The weaker the motives of action are, the more will those motives be absorbed and neutralized by this difference between attack and defense. More frequently, therefore, will action and warfare be stopped, as indeed experience teaches. <laughs> where, where is this? Ah, yeah must be remembered that all this antedates by some years introduction introduction of long range weapons um, and I, that that doesn't necessarily hold uh that that editor's note defensive warfare is still uh warfare always favors the defender uh except when we're talking about absolute warfare like uh you know complete bombardment of cities or we're talking about nuclear warfare or you know um chemical warfare or something like that by and large when it comes to conventional warfare conventional warfare gives the advantage to the defender and that's what Clausewitz is speaking about a second ground consists in imperfect knowledge of circumstances don't worry kids we're uh we're very close to the end of chapter one. You're like, shit, Alex, it's been over an hour. Yeah, yeah, I know. This this is a hard read. This is a very hard read. This is a very long read. And honestly, big parts of it are not fun. Like, it's it's very, very of this time, and I hear you, but it's fucking important for these kind of elements that we teased out earlier. And there's a few other gems in here, but we'll get there. There is still another cause which may stop action in war, an incomplete view of the situation. Each commander can only fully know their own positions. That of their opponents can only be known to him by reports, which are uncertain. They may therefore form a wrong judgment with respect to it upon data of this description, and in consequence of that error, they may suppose that the power of taking the initiative rests with their adversary when it really lies with themselves. This want of perfection, perfect insight might certainly just as often occasion an untimely action as untimely inaction, and hence it in itself no more contri contributes to delay than to acceleration in war. Still, it must always be regarded as one of the most natural causes which may bring action in war to stand still without involving a contradiction. But if we reflect how much more we are inclined and induced to estimate power of our opponents too high than too low because it lies in human nature to do so, 
we shall admit that our imperfect insight into facts, in general, must contribute very much to de delay action in war to modify the application of principles pending our conduct. The possibility of a standstill brings into action a war of new modification, inasmuch it delotes the action with the element of time, checks the influence or sense of danger in its course, and increases the means of reinstating a lost balance of force. The greater the tension of feelings from which the war springs, the greater, therefore, the enemy, the energy with which it's carried on. So much the shorter will be the periods of inaction. On the other hand, the weaker the principle of warlike activity, the longer will be these periods for powerful motives increase the force of will, and this, as we know, is always a factor in the product of force. The slower the action proceeds in war, the more frequent and longer the periods of inaction, so much the more easily can an error be repaired. Therefore, so much the bolder a general will need to be in their calculations, so much more readily they will need to keep them in line below the line of absolute and build everything upon probabilities and conjecture, thus accor according as the course of war is more or less slow, more or less time will be allowed for that which the nature of concrete case particularly requires calculation of probability based on given circumstances. We see from foregoing how much the objective nature of war makes on a calculation of its probabilities, now there's only one single element still wanting to make it a game. And that element is certainly not without. And it is certainly not without. It's chance. There is no human affair which stands so constantly and so generally in close connection with chances as war. They spelled connection with an X here again? I, I really wonder why they did that, but okay, sure. And together with chance, the accidental, and along with its good luck, occupy a great place in war. Not often. It's, it's very not often that you have... Uh, fortune and luck being talked about in strategic terms like even if you plan everything out sometimes you get unlucky <laughs> um on to 21 war is a game both objectively and subjectively if we now look at the subjective nature of war that is to say those conditions under which it must be carried on it will appear to us still more like a game Primarily, the element in which the operations of war are carried on is danger. But which of all the moral qualities is the first in danger? Courage. Now certainly courage is quite compatible with prudent calculation, but there's still things of a different kind, essentially different qualities of the mind. On the other hand, daring, reliance on good fortune, boldness, rashness, are only expressions of courage. And all those propensities of the mind look for the fortuitous, or accidental, because it's their element. We see, therefore, how, from the commencement, the absolute, the mathematical, as it is called, nowhere finds any sure basis in the calculations of the art of war. And from the outset, there's a play of possibilities, probabilities, good and bad luck, which spreads about with all the coarse and fine threads of its web, and makes war of all branches of human activity the most like a gambling game. If you think that war games are new, <laughs> if you think that strategy games, first person shooters, are the advent of a modern era, you're very wrong. You're very, very wrong. All this accords best with the human mind in general. Although our intellect always feels itself urged towards clearness and certainty, still our mind often feels itself attracted by uncertainty. Instead of threading its way with the understanding along narrow path of philosophical investigations and logical conclusions in order, almost unconscious of itself, to arrive in spaces where it feels itself a stranger, where it seems to part from all well-known objects, it prefers to remain with the imagination in the realms of chance and luck, instead of living yonder on poor necessity, it revels here in wealth of possibilities, animated thereby courage, 
then takes wings to itself. Daring and danger make the element into which it launches itself as a fearless swimmer plunges into a stream. Show theory, leave it here, move on, self-satisfied with absolute conclusions and rules, then it's of no practical use. Theory must also take into account the human element. It must accord a place to courage, to boldness, even to rashness. The art of war has to deal with living and moral forces, the consequence of which is that it can never attain an absolute and positive. There's everything, there is therefore everywhere a margin for the accidental. And just as much in the greatest things as in the smallest. There is room in this accidental on one hand. So on the other, there must be courage and self-reliance in proportion to room available. If these qualities are forthcoming in a high degree, the margin left may likewise be great. Courage and self-reliance are therefore principal quite essential to the war. Consequently, theory must only set up such rules as allow ample scope for all degrees and varieties of these necessary and noblest of military virtues. In daring, there may still be wisdom, and prudence as well, only they are estimated by a different standard of value. Now, some of this may seem like common sense, but at the time, remember, and even even up to very close to the modern day, this idea that warfare uh, was something of courage, you know, uh, talking about even in the First World War, Second World War, even, uh, this idea of cowardice, uh, people being sent home for PTSD, being cowards or shell-shocked and being thought of negatively, and that there is a certain wisdom and not being rash is uh, an unpopular thing to say. That there is a wisdom in holding back and maybe practicing a little cowardice is not, uh, not the party line for a lot of militant theory of this time and uh, later times. And we only have a few more sections till the end of the chapter, right? I'm reassuring myself. Yeah, just four more pages. <laughs> the long book. Such is war. Such the commander who conducts it. Such the theory which rules it. And no war is no pastime. No mere passion for venturing and winning. A work of free enthusiasm. It's a serious means for a serious object. All that appearance which it wears from various hues of fortune, all that it assimilates into itself from the oscillations of passion, of courage, of imagination, of enthusiasm, are only particular properties of this means. War of a community, of whole nations, and particularly of civilized nations, always starts from a political condition and is called forth from a political motive. It's therefore a political act. Now, if it were perfect, unrestrained, and absolute expression of force as we had deduced it from its mere conception, then the moment it's called forth by policy, it would step into the place of policy. And as something quite independent of it would set it aside and only follow its own laws, just as a mine at the moment of explosion cannot be guided into any other direction than that which it is given by the preparatory arrangements. This is how the thing has really been viewed hitherto. Whenever a want of harmony between policy and conduct of war has led to theoretical distinctions of the kind, it's not so, and the idea is radically false. War in the real world, as we've already seen, is not an extreme thing, which expends to itself at one single discharge. It's the operation of powers which do not develop themselves completely in the same manner and in the same measure, but which at one time expand sufficiently to overcome resistance opposed by inertia or friction. While at another, they are too weak to produce an effort. It is therefore, in a certain measure, a pulsation of violent force more or less vehement, consequently making its discharges and exhausting its powers more or less quickly. In other words, conducting more or less quickly to the aim, but always lasting long enough to admit its influence being exerted on it in its course, 
so as to give it this or that direction. In short, to be subject to the will of a guiding intelligence. Now, if we reflect that war has its root in political object, then naturally the original motive which called it into existence should also continue the first and highest consideration in its conduct. Still, the political object is no despotic lawgiver on that account. It must accommodate itself to the nature of the means. And though changes in the means may involve modification in the political objective, the latter always retains a prior right to consideration. Policy, therefore, is interwoven with the whole action of war and must exercise a continuous influence upon it as far as the nature of forces liberated by it will permit. Here, at last, we've reached the most famous fucking quote in this book. War is a mere continuation of policy by other means. This is what I keep quoting. This is why I wanted to read this chapter to you. This is why we've been here for an hour and a half. This is incredibly, incredibly important to understanding the modern world and, and, and understanding history. We see, therefore, war is not merely a political act, but also a real political instrument. A continuation of political commerce, a carrying out of the same thing by other means. All beyond this, which is strictly peculiar to war, relates merely to the peculiar nature of the means which it uses. That these tendencies and views of policy should not be compatible with these means, the art of war in general, and the commander in each particular case, may demand this claim is not a trifling one. But however powerfully this may react on political views in particular cases, still it must always be regarded as only a modification of them, for the political view is the object. War is the means, and the means must always include that object in our conception. This is so goddamn important to understand. War is not th this thing outside of politics. War is not this thing outside of economics. War is not this weird outside alien thing that just happens sometimes. War is a consequence of material conditions, a consequence of political conditions, a consequence of social conditions. War is a continuation of politics by other means. War is a consequence of politics. And it's, I talked about it at the beginning, as we teased apart at the beginning. War isn't just something that happens between two armed nations. War happens between classes. War happens between genders. War happens between races. It happens between any two groups divested by having mutually exclusive interests and are pursuing those interests to the detriment of the other. Right? Right? War happens every day in so many ways. There is not one war, there are many wars. There are many wars happening in many directions. There are constant struggles. You know, uh, Marx writes about class struggle, class warfare. And again, we, we have this real aversion in the modern world and the West, particularly in these United States, to avert our language from talking about class warfare, talking about race warfare, talking about warfare in general when it comes to social and political upheaval, social and political change, social and political machinations, but politics is war. If war is politics, politics is war. Just done in a different way. It's using different tools in a different setting. But uh, as he talked about in the beginning, you don't spontaneously pop into war. Politics is the build-up to that war. If there's violence, if there's violence you would characterize as a war, that violence didn't start with the first brick. It didn't start with the first water bottle. It didn't start with the first bullet. It started with policy. It started with a political object and the moving 
of social, political, and economic forces to pursue that political object. Diversity in the nature of wars. The greater and more powerful the motives of a war, the more it affects the whole existence of a people. The more violent the excitement which precedes the war, by so much more the nearer will the war approach to its abstract form. So much the more will it be directed to the destruction of the enemy. So much nearer will the military and political ends coincide, so much more purely military and less political the war appears to be. But the weaker the motives and the tensions, so much that the less will be the natural direction of the military element, that is force, be coincident with the direction of the political element indicates, so much more must, therefore, the war become diverted from its natural direction, the political object diverge from the aim of an ideal war, and the war appear to become political. But that the reader may not form any false conceptions, we must here observe that by this natural tendency of war, we only mean the philosophical, the strictly logical, and by no means the tendency of forces actually engaged in conflict, by which we would be, be supposed to include all the emotions and passions of combatants. No doubt, in some cases, there might be excited to such a degree as to be with difficulty restrained and confined to the political road, but in most cases, such a contradiction will not arise, because by the existence of such strenuous exertions, a great plan and harmony therewith would be implied. If the plan is directed only upon a small object, then the impulses of feeling amongst the masses will also be so weak that these masses will require to be stimulated rather than repressed. They may all be regarded as political acts. Returning now to the main subject. Although it's true that only one kind of war, the political element, seems almost to disappear, whilst in another it occupies a very prominent place, we may affirm, still, that one is a political object as much as the other, for if we regard state policy as the intelligence of the personified state, then amongst all the constellations in the political sky which movements it has to computate, compute, computate, compute, those must be included which arise when the nature of its relations imposes the necessity of a great war. It's only if we understand by policy not a true application of affairs in general, but the conventional conceptual conception of a cautious, subtle, and also dishonest craftiness, averse from violence, that the latter kind of war may belong to more to policy than the first. I, I do like calling out cautious, subtle, dishonest craftiness, averse to violence, as itself a form of warfare. <laughs> I, I, I dressed upon that earlier, I touched upon that earlier, but it's, it's a nice reinforcement that it doesn't just have to be violent in a certain degree, in a certain variety. We see, therefore, in the first place, that under all circumstances, war is to be regarded not as an independent thing, but as a political instrument. It's only by taking this point of view that we can avoid finding ourselves in opposition to all military history. This is the only means of unlocking the great book and making it intelligible. Secondly, this shows us how wars must differ in character according to the nature of motives and circumstances from which they proceed. Now the first, the grandest, the most decisive of judgment which the statesman in general exercises is rightly to understand in this respect the war in which they engage. Not to take it for something or to wish to make of it something, which by the nature of its relations it's impossible for it to be, this is therefore the first and most comprehensive of all strategical questions. We shall enter into this more fully in treating the plan of a war. For the present, we content ourselves with having brought up the subject to this point, and having thereby fixed the chief point of view from which war and its theory are to be studied. The result for theory. War is therefore not only a chameleon-like character, because it changes its color in some degree in each particular case, but it is also, as a whole, 
in relation to the predominant tendencies which are in it, a wonderful trinity, composed of the original violence of its elements, hatred and animosity which may be looked upon as blind instinct, of the play of probabilities and chance which make it an activity, free activity of the soul, and of the subordinate nature of the political instrument by which it belongs purely to reason. The first of these phases concerns more the people, the second the general and their army, the third the government. The passions which break forth in war must already have a latent existence in people. The range which this display of courage and talent get in the realm of probabilities and of chance depends on a particular characteristic of the general and their army. But the political objects belong to the government alone. These three tendencies, which appear like so many different lawgivers, are deeply rooted in the nature of the subject. At the same time, a variable in degree. A theory which would leave one of them out of account, or set up any sort of arbitrary relation between them, would immediately become involved in such a contradiction with reality that might be regarded as destroyed at once by that alone. The problem, therefore, is that theory should keep itself poised in a manner between these tendencies, as between three points of attraction. The way in which, alone, this difficult problem can be solved, we shall examine in this book on the theory of war. In every case, the conception of war, as here defined, will be the first ray of light which shows us the true foundation of theory, and which first separates the great masses and allows us to distinguish them from one another. End of chapter one. It's been an hour and a half. It's a long fucking book. Look, look at this. Look at this. This is as far as I am. That's just chapter one. That's just this. I literally just read you this. I didn't read. It's a long, long, long goddamn book. It gets oddly specific about oh, a lot of things, but uh, yeah, what is war? If any of this has been interesting to you, I, you know, it's free. It's free. It's online. Gutenberg Project is amazing. Absolutely check it out. Uh, book one on the nature of war is great shit. On the theory of war, great shit, strategy of war. I mean, it's all it's all interesting. Uh, some of it, uh, particularly when you get into book five, book six, book seven, uh, book eight, even are a little dated and up their time, but still relevant. But oh my god, I did not expect that to take that long. Uh, <laughs> what did we learn? What did we learn today? Uh, War is the continuation of politics by other means. War and the scope of war is driven by the pursuit of a political object. Getting or securing that goal does not necessarily assert the end of a war. The end of a war is when the conflict and struggle ends. So that this, this warfare on racial equality. It never ended. The war for gender equality hasn't quite ended. No. These these conflicts that we like to talk about as being over is decided until there is absolutely no chance that the victory can be overturned, that the end can be taken back, then the war is not over. Wars are constant, relentless things happening materially, happening politically, happening physically, on many, 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 many levels. And that the ultimate goal of a war is to disarm and uh, yeah, disarm and defuse your enemy. 
You can do that through brute force, but you can also do that through politics, you can do that through entertainment, you can do that through making them financially dependent, economically dependent, you can do that through making them poor, you can do that through taking away their material means to resist, you can do that through taking away their will to resist, you can do that by giving them something else that they are more angry about. You can do that by redirecting their anger and their frustration or presenting a political object which is more valuable to them and they'll instead focus on that means rather than the one that puts you at odds with one another. Yeah, you know, there's, there's a lot that you can extrapolate from this and that's why it's really important framework when we're talking about modern history, when we're talking about modern politics, when we're talking about modern political movements because it's never just A and B, it's never just people shooting at each other from across the field or across the city block. It's a lot more complicated than that, and it's a lot more drawn out than that. And behind every war is a slow build up to that war, or a rapid build up to that war. And yeah, 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 yeah. Carl von Clausewitz, it's been two hours. I'm gonna, oh god not stare at a screen for a little while my brain's going i may come back to this but as you can see it's a long fucking book and uh it took two hours to get through chapter one i don't have i don't have this time i don't have this time to to read you a story god help if there's an audiobook on this uh it's a, to be fair about a fifth of the way through but Oh lordy. Alright, um, I'm gonna put in the cut in here. I don't know when I will be back or what I will be back with. Uh, you know, uh, it's not my fault the city government's being a real, real Nancy about, uh, not bending to the will of the people. But hey, day 36 of protest. Let's make it 37 tomorrow. Until tomorrow or later, I will say toodaloo. Take care. I will see you then. Bye bye. Or the hotkeys could just, you know, not work. That's cool too. Okay, okay, okay.